Uh, welcome to uh, welcome this next session. Uh, first, an announcement. When you're up here speaking and you go over here to point to something, it's not recorded because you're away from the microphone. Same when you're uh, asking questions. You have to have the microphone. Uh, I don't know if anybody looked at YouTube last night, but every time anybody was away from the microphone, zip, not recorded. So when you're answering questions, do it from here. Thank you. All right, let me catch you. Every time you get up here, I run out of breath. Uh, Sarah Tyak is one of those people that does not need an introduction. But she is the, uh, and her biography goes on forever, many, many honors a lifetime of recognition. But she is the former chief executive of the United Kingdom National Records. She's a companion of the Order of Bath. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> at, at which probably means more to us. Uh, she's the former deputy map librarian of the British Library, Sarah. Thanks very much, Greg, and um, I'm hoping that some of this will work. Uh, I should say that this is a minute bit of my study into Dudley and his Arcano del Mare from the point of view of the charts. My interest is not carto bibliographical, but I've had to deal with some carto bibliographical issues. My, and I am not um, going to go into his sources in this presentation, but I suppose I could answer the old question. Anyway, oop. the origins and development of his Mercator projection. And this is just to give you a list of what I'm going to be talking about very briefly. Um, <clears throat> Dudley's Arcano del Mare, or Secrets of the Sea, which he wrote, compiled, and edited from the 1630s onwards and published in 1646 to 8 had much earlier origins. We know of a set of colored manuscript charts dating from the 1630s and over 300 manuscript drafts for the compilation and editing of the Arcano, which was finally published in a very long drawn out process from 1642 onwards. Dudley then died in 1648 when he just published it, age 75. But the history of the charts dates from much earlier period of the, uh, of, this, of the 1590s and Dudley's voyage to Guiana and to the Orinoco. <coughs> this is a hero, um, age, seven, uh, age 17. Um, oh, sorry, I beg your pardon. This is Robert Dudley's Arcano del Mare, the title page. Um, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the wrong slide, typical. Um, our particular relevance to the origins is the discussion of navigation in books one to five, um, using what contemporaries called waxing latitude charts. This was the usual nomenclature in Dutch and English charting circles of what we now call right Mercator um, or just Mercator charts. Dudley was also concerned to demonstrate that great circle sailing would make the shortest and quickest route across oceans. The books also covered other practical nautical themes, including shipbuilding, he did do that too, and the positioning of a fleet for battle at sea. <clears throat> Book six was a maritime atlas of uh, 131 charts on larger scales, as we would call them, covering the known world, including the East Indies, which had not been published before, uh, owing to the Dutch um, uh, censorships. Overall, the Arcano was designed um, to uh, educate the mariner, if I'm allowed to use that term, the navigator, um, and Dudley ended his work with the words that it has been constructed to help those who navigate the sea that they may avoid its dangers. 
<coughs> so hopefully, here is our hero, uh, Sir Robert Dudley, and we see him five years before he sails to Trinidad and Guiana in 1594. Um, a brief description of who he was. He was an English nobleman, the son of Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester, he left England for personal reasons, which I'm not going into, uh, turned Roman Catholic and was appointed in 1607 by the aspiring empire builder Ferdinand I, Grand Duke of Tus Tuscany, and lived in Florence and, and indeed Livorno. Uh, thanks for the mentions by Manuel uh, of Livorno and the San Stefano Knights with whom he worked. Um, and, there, and he was appointed for his expertise in uh, shipbuilding, engineering, naval warfare, and of course for his navigational knowledge and for his mathematical instrument making. So we have to know a bit about his career in England prior to 1607, uh, which gives us some understanding as to why he used the right Mercator projection for charts with waxing latitudes. Dudley said, and he was a great one for telling you about things, um, he was a precocious seafarer with a love of all things nautical from the age of 17. Uh, as you can see, here he is looking the picture, so to speak. Um, it's important for consideration of the charts in the Ocarno that Dudley knew and was the patron of nearly all the London mathematical instrument makers who were often mapping gravers as well. And he took 19 nautical and astronomical instruments with him when he went to Florence. Right, oops, here's his voyage. This is Dudley um, on his voyage, taking a chart by Thomas Hood, one of the, one of the chart makers of London. Uh, he never lost his interest in Guiana and the region stretching south to the river Amazon, and he kept and revised this chart of the Caribbean of 1592, which he took with him on his voyage of 1594. He also proposed to Ferdinand I a voyage to Guiana um, in 1608, which was undertaken. On the slide, note the daily positioning of the ship. This is my scribbled red line. Or, uh, or it's either Dudley or his ship's master, Abraham Kendall's um, daily positioning of the ship. Uh, the, the positioning, which can be easily, more easily seen on the next slide, I hope, is here and this again is Hood's chart but it's in black and white and it's easier to see uh, the positioning which it would have been by dead reckoning and if, if possible observation to determine latitude. The numbers probably represent consecutive days and I'm indebted to Joachim for suggesting that the distance sailed between day 47 and 48 um, <coughs> uh, would have been uh, two degrees point eight, or a, I wish I could read that, 168 nautical miles. This corresponds to an average speed of seven knots, which is reasonable for a sailing ship. However, this base chart is of course a common or plain chart with equal spacing of latitudes, but it would seem Dudley and his ship's master, Abraham Kendall, had an already determined in 1594 on a better method of navigating as Dudley was to instruct his readers in the, in the Arcano. Um, uh, obviously, in order to produce his Mercator charts, Dudley needed to establish a prime meridian to place the 360 degrees of longitude round the globe onto his charts. And the logbook or rutter by Abraham Kendall of the 1594 voyage, which Dudley first published in Italian in the Arcano in 1646, makes it clear why he chose the island of Pico in the Azores for his prime meridian. On the way back across the Atlantic, he records, then we began to run before a great storm to latitude 38 degrees 20 minutes, um, distant by the common chart 
from the islands of Flores or Corvo in the Azores, 120 leagues, from which one learns how false the chart is that it makes the distance too much by about 80 leagues by the Great Circle. And then we pass the meridian of the island of Pico and the variation or declination was imperceptible and therefore we count the longitude from the same island as Pico. This is the origin of the Arcano Prime Meridian. Dudley ref uh, continued to revise his charts up to 1646 and later, um, but obviously this point of no variation was determined by his experience on the 1594 voyage. I told you I was talking about origins, I am. <laughs> he then goes on to demonstrate practically from the same candle rutter the use of great circle navigation, which was the shortest way to sail between two points, east-west or vice versa. How did they actually do it? It is clear that on this 1594 voyage, they actually had a globe on board and used it to navigate by great circle sailing for at least some of the time. Kendall, having decided to set sail for Trinidad, um, sorry, I've just got confused there, uh, said um, from Cape Blanco on the west coast of Africa, then recorded, so we steered west southwest as far as 90 degrees 35 minutes, keeping the same quarter to 18 degrees 50, the intersection of which with the latitude gave the longitude on the globe, following the same run through latitude 18 degrees 21, 22 minutes and 17 degrees 8 minutes, 190 leagues distant from Cape, Cape Blanco, and in 16 degrees 22 minutes. So again, he then says that this was far better than on the common chart. So you can see why he wanted to do that. He then goes on to explain how he got hold of the rutter. It was under, among the writings of Abraham Kendall when he died at Portobello uh, in the Indies with Drake in 1596. And so it would seem the origin of his interest in great circle sailing and indeed in waxing latitude charts uh, and the inclusion of longitude on his charts derived from 1594. Now, the issue therefore arises, which globe uh, did Kendall and Dudley use in 1594 um, in order to actually um, do the calculation for the, um, for the Great Circle sailing? So it's tempting to suggest that the globe was that by Emery Molyneux, in 15, which was made in 1592 which had a diameter of 63.5 centimetres, 25 inches. There were a few globes made before 1600 which were large enough to be candidates for measurable use. And another candidate for the globe is by the Dutch globe maker Jacob Floris van Langren, who stated in 1592 that several ships sailing from the Netherlands to Pernambuco in Brazil, oh, excuse me, had globes on board and that navigation with globes was easier than with charts. I mean, being a globe maker, he would say that, wouldn't he? However, they obviously did from time to time. Whichever globe it was, it was large enough to be able to be used to read off the coordinates of at whatever position the ship was and to enable the course for great circle navigation to be reset in terms of direction in suitably small sections of 20 English degrees or to one degree as indicated in the extract from the Kendall Rutter that I quoted above. Um, this was also uh, described by the great navigator John Davis in the Seaman Secrets of 1593. However, the problem was that globes were rather awkward to take on board and they fell out of use during the course of the 17th century. <coughs> now, we then, I think, have to move on uh, to a further question arises, 
uh, as a globe was used on board, uh, apart from being an exploratory voyage to Trinidad and Guiana, was it also a navigational exercise to test great circle sailing? And this possibility has to be seen in the context that copies of the manuscript of certain errors of navigation by Edward Wright were known to be circulating as Wright admits himself uh, prior to uh, the, um, the actual um, publication in 1599. Wright gives clues as to who might have had that manuscript, or one of them at least, when he says certain errors was going to the press under the name of one of the Skilfordist navigators, as he was, was by many reputed of our time and nation. Uh, and um, out of his many experiments and observations at sea, and was at that time especially when he was about to leave his life, uh, i.e. he was about to die, um, and therefore this volume, this manuscript was about to be produced. This is a relatively well-known story, but it's quite important thinking about um, 1594 voyage. So the thing is that this was almost certainly Abraham Kendall, who, as I've already explained, had died on the last voyage of Drake in 1586. So it seems likely, therefore, that Dudley also knew it on his 1594 voyage with Kendall, uh, since he had subsequently Kendall's Rutter II, um, as I think my slide has told you. Um, now, I'm not going to go into meridional parts uh, and Wright's um, mathematical explanation, but um, just to point out that he does explain that, in principle, in this uh, cartouche of the 1610 uh, chart by Edward Wright, that you have to keep the parts of the meridians and parallels in proportion everywhere which he had already explained in his certain edition, in his former edition of Certain Errors, 1599, which we suppose Kendall had in 1592, and so was known to, and so was known to Dudley. Well, I think so anyway. So anyway, to go back to Dudley and his charts, as distinct from the very early part of his, of Dudley's origins, here is Wright's. Uh, Sorry, oh, that's Wright's diagram. Sorry, my mistake. Uh, I'm not going to go into any of that. I'm going to go back to his charts. And Dudley is here in the 1630s drawing or having drawn charts on the Mercator projection with the latitude scale. Uh, note there are no rum lines. On the left hand side, labelling the latitude scale, he has added. La scala di latitudine migliore, or in English, the best latitude scale, which was indeed a waxing latitude scale. Um, now, uh, he then advises in Book 6 uh, about his overall purpose, because obviously it is an immense work, and he had to say what he was up to. In 1646, he clearly states at the end of Book 5, in his advice for the forthcoming sixth book, his overall intentions for the whole uh, uh, publication of the charts. And in translation of part of this relevant uh, passage, but for the perfect navigation of longitude, the aforementioned general charts must necessarily be used on the high seas. Otherwise, it would never be possible to navigate that way of longitude. And this is the difference between the choreographical, or the particular charts of the sixth book, and the general charts of the second book, is the general charts, the ones I'm talking about. Otherwise, for the navigation of longitude and great circles as more perfect, the general charts of the second book can serve in perfection enough. But how did he propose to do this? Well, Dudley was nothing if not um, ingenious, and as I've explained, he did instruments, or made the instruments, or had them made. So he <coughs> invented these... Have I got the right one? Hang on. Yes. 
he produced what he called Trevisali Svericali. And um, as you can see, uh, and this is the, just the translation into English the, of these things, and here are the, the spherical traverses. Um, and they go up to seven, they were a substitute for having a globe on board. Um, and he presents his tables as a substitute for the lines of longitude and latitude on a globe. In this case, specifically for great circle sailing without a globe on board. I am not entirely sure how these 72 traverses um, uh, would work. I mean, 12 traverses making, um, yes, these 12 traverses or tables were constructed, but they seem to narrow in width like globe bores as the northerly latitudes increase and the distances between parallels of latitude. Uh, are increased. They go up to 78 degrees in latitude, and in terms of longitude, for example, west to east, they so show five degrees in one degree units, or 20 English le leagues to a degree. This was obviously necessary for checking and altering your course during your voyage to follow a great circle course, and is his substitute for a globe. Dudley goes on to give some examples of how to do this, and he refers to Wright as a learned mathematician who explained the principles of increasing latitude charts and how to adjust your course to use the shortest way between two places. Dudley does not deal with the maths, only the operation and instrumental procedure he proposes. He is quite specific about that, in the same figure, one sees well the difference mentioned above without lengthening the point in the description, since in these things, where it is a question of the execution of instruments, the figures are enough to apply, to apply them in practice and not to prove the reason mathematically. Um, uh, typical Dudley view. Uh, and then he explains further how you could do it and how big the globe would be. I have to tell you, that if you can remember what the Coronelli's in Versailles look like, you have a good idea of the size of this globe, which I did, in fact, um, measure with the assistance of Sylvia Sumira. And he also um, had a chart projector, protractor to, to deal with taking measurements, um, which, in fact, was one that he brought with him and is illustrated in the Arcano. Now we come on to his own maps. This is one of his manus colored manuscript maps of the Orinoco in 1630. And he specifically notes the use of increasing spacing of the degrees of latitude on the map. And it is to be noted that in this map, each degree of latitude is divided into 60 minutes or approximately miles, which serve as the scale of distance in each degree, etc., etc. Now, I did sort of think to myself, I ought to inquire as to whether his maps were on the Mercator projection. And I did actually ask Joachim if he would just have a look to see if the map of <coughs> the Mediterranean, um, you know, could correspond. And it does, more or less, as he said. Um, and um, if the coordinates of the places were accurate, the interpolated meridians and parallels would coincide with those of the map's graticule. As you see, there are significant latitude and longitude errors, but that is to be expected, I suppose. And I think the reason is, as obviously anybody would know, and, his co and Dudley's contemporaries knew, that you had to work out the latitudes and longitudes in particular of places which were far less well known than those of the Mediterranean. And here we see him trying to place the islands of the Antilles in the Caribbean. And the legend reads, Questa carta um, per la latitude corretta per l'osservazione, excuse my Italian, de famissime piloto Abrahamo Kendall Inglesi. 
So he, here he is using, again, Kendall's rudder to try to work out what the longitudes were. Indeed, all his islands had this problem, whether they were Iceland or whatever. So what do we, to return to my beginning um, thought on what were the origins, I would have to say that it's not a foregone conclusion that he would have drawn the, the Arcano charts on the Mercator projection. And we know that English ship's masters, and no doubt others, uh, working for the East India Company in the early 17th century, complained about Mercator charts because they did not, from their point of view, manage to get their ships to their destination successfully. Um, not until, I would say, about the 1630s did the right Mercator charts begin to have any effect in terms of oceanic practical use. Here we have Charles Salton Stahl, a naval captain and a teacher of navigation on a voyage to the West Indies in the 1630s. And he had a, a bet, a wager, with Dutch and English masters in the fleet that the common or plain chart that some were using would not be correct in keeping their reckoning. Um, and he won, triumphantly claiming that the plain chart, which you see apparently, hath need of crutches, being lame in all its liniments, uh, liniments or lines, okay? Um, Dudley was concerned, therefore, to provide the best advice and the best charts to navigate, especially east and west across the oceans. And he therefore determined to use the waxing latitude charts of Wright, Mercator, which he himself um, <clears throat> had um, experience of. And he also included longitude meridians, 360 degrees or naught degrees, from the prime meridian of Pico in the Azores. Uh, I should say he also noted values of magnetic declination across the oceans, but that is another another lecture which you could well do without all of which all of all of his um, experiences um, can be, all of his work can be traced back to his practical experience in navigation instrument making and the work of Edward Wright and his mentors Abraham Kendall and John Davis I hope therefore that in this particular case although it is a beautiful atlas and obviously used as a coffee table atlas in some aristocratic circles, um, that Dudley's nautical charts can only be understood in the context of the specific navigational methods they were intended to support, to follow my colleagues Joachim and Enrique Letao, um, and second, that a nautical chart should not be considered as a true geographical map to take us back to previous um, uh, discussions and presentations, but as an instrument for navigation. <clears throat> I don't know how far. Is that all right? Can I stop? <laughs> Where's the chair? <laughs> Chair, chair, help. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sarah Tayak. Do we have any questions, please? There's a question. Oh, no, it's Shima. <laughs> <laughs> the microphone is yours. Yes. Well, at least they didn't catch that bit. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. OK. So we've talked before about um, fixing positions on more ornamental charts than one might expect. That chart that you showed us with your red scribble. Yes. Do we ha Was this a personal possession that yes. he brought on the ship? That's it. It belonged, so, to, it belonged to Dudley, Okay. and he kept it from the voyage, okay. he actually used it mm -hmm. to make general charts for the Arcano. Um, and he actually, because I know, because I've got some other stuff, he actually changed um, the island of Trinidad 
according to his own observations when he was there. I'm perfectly satisfied with that answer. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? Oh, three down here, please. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, your presentation uh, looked to me as a kind of appetizer for a big meal that, that is still in preparation. I'm referring to, to the long period about which we know very little of transition between the so-called plane chart Latitude. and the Mercator projection. We don't, we don't have enough information about that process. Surveys had to be made, of course, uh, to determine latitudes and longitudes uh, of, the, uh, of the places, and also surveys of magnetic declination so that they could use effectively the marine comp compass together with the Wait. Mercator chart. Do you have any plans to handle this, this difficult subject? Well, I mean, the, the problem is that there are three, you know, I have a problem. It's known as 300 drafts of Dudley. Now, Dudley is obviously an interesting character because he knows all the chart makers. I mean, it is true that he's not up to date in some respects, and his critics at the time sort of said, you know, you haven't, de you haven't dealt with all the Dutch, you know. And so that's why there's this hiatus from 1646 to 48. And he revises um, his work on the basis of printed material as well as Porter Lands. Cavallini springs to mind. He knew Cavallini and, you know, his first... Um, one of his first uh, editions of the first volumes, not, not the big fat one, the six, uh, were presented to the Commodore of the St San Stefano Knights. So you're in a situation where, you know, he is educating, he's pushing for a new way of navigation and a new way of presenting charts, which he thought would actually be of use practically because that was what he was trying to do. In answer to your question about the generality of the transition, this I think is much more of a difficulty because my strengths insofar as I have any are to do obviously with the northerners, the Dutch and the English, and um, are based it obviously on a lot of other people's work, let's face it. Um, so it's difficult for me to exactly get the exact thread coming through and when the Mercator, as Tony was discussing, not only gets into land maps, which is very interesting, but is actually, as we are just discussing, when it actually becomes useful at sea. I mean, obviously, Saltonstall is, you know, very cross that Dutch and English navigators are not using uh, the Mercator to go across the um, Atlantic, and I'm sure there are lots of other examples. Normally, uh, commentators just settle for saying, they had them on board, so they must have used them, to which the answer is, how do you know? <laughs> So it's me. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, uh, I have two questions. And the first one is just uh, the, the next question after what you just said. Uh, the use on board. Yes. Uh, you you sh show the, the map with uh, some inscriptions that um, prove that it was on board. And yes. The yes. But the question is, it, it didn't use it to navigate. He's used no. it to correct a previous yes. map. So uh, it's an intellectual use and not the practical for navigation. Well, he had it on board. Yes, he had it on board, but he didn't use it 
to make his way. He used no, no, it no. to correct another map. I, I think I understand like that, but it's a question. What do you think about it? Well, do you, do you see what I mean? I mean, uh, in the previous study I, look, I found, I didn't find, somebody else found, you know, it's just a blank piece of paper about 1600 and the, the navigator has drawn, you know, mm -hmm. this, this, and he's got this a way. bit of a compass rose and he is just plotting himself as he goes along, uh, you know, w yeah. where he's going. Now, if you, if you imagine the, this intermediary stage, you can see that you would then put, if you wished, it onto the big main map or the map that you were using. Yes, so, the, so, so it's both. Uh, it he be. used it to navigate and then he could correct a, a previous map. That's, that was... Uh, yes, I did. Yes. Um, maybe... Um, yes, but he, I mean, he had no reason to correct a previous map. He was just using it. No, you, you proved that he corrected, uh, I, if I understood well, but we can discuss afterward. <laughs> uh, I understood that he, he made the correction on a previous map and corrected the position of the islands, for example. Oh, Antilles. Sorry, yes. I was thinking of something else. I okay. beg your pardon entirely. Mm. Okay. Um, yes, <laughs> indeed. His, the thing is that he or his draftsman, which I'm not going to talk about today, they were making charts um, for the Arcano, and Dudley, with pencil, we know it's him because it's in English, and my colleague in, the in Munich, where they all are, we agree that this is Dudley, and he is saying, you've got to move it this way, you've got to move it that way, and you know, in this case, Kendall says it's here. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Okay, sorry, and I uh, misunderstood your uh, question. Yes, but, but we, well, maybe I misunderstood too. <laughs> uh, uh, well, the, the second question, that's all. Uh, I was amazed about the use of globes on board. Yes. So, do you have other? I know you would be amazed. Oh, yes, it's wonderful. So, so if you have other indication of this story of globes on board, that would be well. I mean, well the welcome. thing is, he's, they say that they had it on board. From from which date do you know? Well, this when? is fifteen ninety four. Yes, but before, we don't have any other... Well, we do in the Hacklet series. We know that Richard Chancellor, in the 1550s, he took a globe to get round the Northeast Passage. I mean, how much help it would have been is, a, is a, another question. But I think people... You know, they took what they had. It was a question of uncertainty and mm -hmm. wanting to have some some sort of support. Yes, but it's very interesting. The, the way they used uh, the maps in the Middle Ages was the same. It was uh, just a, a broad indication, oui. uh, but uh, absolutely not uh, effi uh, efficient for small distances. So maybe it's the same idea. I have a broad idea of what the globe is, and I will add some new information on it. Yes. I agree. Oh no. <laughs> Luis, did you have one? I don't know. Who is it? Talk again. Thanks a lot. Uh, about globes, um, well, uh, I think the questions here are, are the same. But the, um, what it seems to me, and maybe I'm being oversimplistic, is that there's a, a geographical problem and a, technique, a technical navigation problem. Yes. Because, uh, for instance, the Antilles, you, you having a Mercator or a plain chart is about the same. Uh, when he, he corrects or someone corrects a place, it's a geographical intervention, not, not a, a nautical um, intervention. Yes, I understand. Yeah. So, um, in that way, I think, uh, uh, unfortunately, Joaquin is not here, but I think that uh, the, the adoption of a Mercator projection, it's exactly the same issue, but some, uh, some years later, as Joaquin has, been, uh, has, has discussed of the, um, what, what he calls the external geometry, internal geometry, yes. and the, the Mercator is just a, 
a later phase. You adopt, you adopt a Mercator um, chart when geographically and technically you can, you can uh, um, use them both. Where the, the technical part of navigation is adjusted to the geographical knowledge. Yes, I understand that. I think, yeah. I think the problem for somebody like Dudley is that he is desperate to get the two together. Yeah, so he is yeah, sure, a prime sure. example of the effort that went sure. into it. And the Antilles, I fully understand what you're telling me, and it is always the islands that cause him the trouble, and he nearly always uses a globe to determine which, you know, which, which bit of source he is going to take, uh, except, of course, if it's a text. And if it's a text, he tends to go with the texts, you know? Sure, of because course. You know, his brain is like that, and uh, yeah. and you can imagine the multiple sources that somebody of his ilk, of his mindset, in the Medici, in Florence, which was the greatest scientific uh, place in Europe, in my opinion, with Galileo and Torricelli and everybody. Uh, you know, he was in the right place at the right time. Mm -hmm. So he would have tried to get the best possible information, but he still has this problem. Yeah, it's the debate that it's going on. Yes. It's the geographical knowledge, because no pilot will ever use theoretical uh, infabulations on board, never. They will, they will trust the, the, the rutters, they will trust navigational uh, information. Yes. And the, the scientific uh, approach is is uh, is is approaching it. well the they're they're sensing it oh they're coming there so uh, the, the they have to 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 match at some place and that's the beautiful story of the 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 mercator uh, adopting mercator projection let me just say something it's important i call it right mercator yes I and agree. i i i'm not english but i i i, <laughs> I defend that right mercator uh, it's important, and uh, well, well, David, David Waters and Taylor have, have, they have also all explained. Yeah, this. yeah, yeah, way but before. But what interests me was the fact that it was a globe. Yeah, and, and, and well, the use of globes and again. Kendall and, uh, says it was a globe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, again, Dudley says it was. Again, it it was uh, Nunes' work yes. on globes from thirty-seven, then sixty-six. It teaches how to to sail using a globe, but yes. very important, you need tables for that. You need to calculate them. And it's a, it's a tedious calculation. And John Dee also, yes, well, as you know, it as did. you know. <laughs> but if you look at Dudley's ingenious idea, it was to have these spherical traverses. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And yeah. you, I didn't explain it very well, but because it's difficult and we would be here all morning, if not all afternoon and next week as well. But, you know, he, he does explain what you're supposed to do with these yeah. things. And, I mean, whether anybody was going to copy them and with a piece of cardboard, he said, you could do, you know, yeah. this, that and the other. Who knows? I would be very surprised. That was clever and I agree with it, your but explanation. Is that, you know, he was trying desperately to get the globe on a plane surface for yeah. the use of the navigator. Sure, sure, sure. Thanks. Can I go away? I think so. Are there any quick comments or quick questions? Very good. Thank you, Sarah. We really very much enjoyed your presentation. That's very kind of you to say so. <laughs> Yes, we need to get rid of it. Let me pull mine up. Does this work? Yes. It's so. a bit of a pain. You have more experience. Well, <laughs> it's, the <laughs> it's the smallest error I've ever seen. Okay, there we go. Just get rid of it. Uh, cancel. It's all right. Oh, I think I was supposed to do something else. Go up there. Just do not uh, save. Yeah, yeah, there, there you go. There, you go. Yeah. there we go. 
Let's see if this is it. Noelle Wilson is a historian of Japan teaching at the University of Mississippi. This talk is part of a book project on the history of blue water sailing in 19th century Japan. Please. Okay, great, thank you. Let's see if I can actually get, I'm realizing, pardon? Yeah, I get, I get that, let's see. Uh, fortunately, our expert tech person is available. Uh, it, it is in PDF, right? That's right. Uh, let me see. Is this one? Uh-huh. Okay. This is all in Portuguese, so... Uh, yeah, that's helpful. Yeah. Just to get it to display. Okay. Um, there you go. It's not... Uh, uh -huh. Wait. Sorry. Okay, so you have the pointer if you want to. It's the so big the one. Yeah. And the... the the one on yeah. the front is to... to oh, yeah. nice. Okay. Okay, excellent. Well, thanks, guys. I feel like a bit of an interloper here because I work on part of the world that um, is not really being addressed otherwise, but hopefully it might be an interesting, I'm going to move this up a bit, counterpoint for discussion. And I have so much to learn from each of you that I've already learned the past 24 hours or so because I'm not originally a historian of cartography or maps, sort of kind of political and... Um, social history, so I appreciate um, the invitation to be involved with this um, esteemed group. <clears throat> I also realize I'm the person who stands between us and lunch, so I think I'll finish a bit early and then we can continue the conversation as we eat. How is that? I'm just going to set up my timer here so that I know um, <coughs> how long we take. So at the risk of seeming a bit pedantic. I just wanted to overview some of the geography of my talk. I'm sure you're uh, kind of aware of this part of, of the world and the specifics of place names, but um, it might be helpful to review. And so um, I'll be talking about what is modern day Japan. Here you see it in the northwest corner of the Pacific. Um, speaking mainly about this northern island today known as Hokkaido, which you see here, um, at the time of the 19th, 18th, 19th century, it was known as Ezo. Um, I'll be speaking about a port city here on the eastern um, seaboard known as Akeshi, and trips from the kind of northern edge of this main island of Honshu, a harbor known as Miyako. And at the time, the capital uh, castle town of the Tokugawa, who ruled Japan, was known as Edo. And today, that is uh, Tokyo here. So a lot of place names, but I'll be returning. Many of them may be familiar to you. But um, if not, I think you'll remember them by the end of the next 25 minutes or so. <clears throat> so in the summer of 1799, when most of my story today takes place, a 55-year-old samurai named Hota Niske sailed roughly 500 kilometers across the open sea from Miyako to the port of Akeshi. And this is the passage here, which I refer to as the East Ezo Ocean Corridor. Hota was a mathematician serving the ruling Tokugawa government. This was the military clan who ruled and supplied the shogun at the time. And he had worked for the past 17 years in their astronomy bureau in the capital of Edo, probably making calendars and calculating lunar eclipses, of which the Japanese were extraordinarily afraid. His open water crossing from Miyako to eastern Ezo constituted the first time on record that Japanese vessels had successfully completed this passage. Now today, in 2023, this journey seems modest, short, and unimpressive. Yet for Hota and his contemporary Japanese, this journey was not a simple feat, since almost all travel on the ocean at that time in Japan occurred within sight of land. Hota's passage, which took four days, was considered dangerous and likely fatal. Many observers thought he was foolhardy. 
But his goal was not simply to survive the crossing, but to map that water route as a visual source for future captains, Japanese captains, who would carry supplies and troops to government outposts on Ezo, which at the time <clears throat> was being encroached upon by Russians and the Tokugawa government needed to ensure the ports on that island could receive supplies and also that they could transport troops if necessary. Holta's journey marked mark the first Japanese attempt to create a nautical chart in over 150 years, probably more like 170. It also marked the return of the samurai, members of the Japanese warrior elite class. It marked their return to travel on the ocean after centuries of movement exclusively on land. The journey resulted in the map seen here. In English, the sea road chart from Edo to Eastern Ezo. And today, I would like to suggest that this passage and map mark the beginning of a revolution, not only in map making, but more broadly in Japan's perspective of the Pacific Ocean. Um, so it was actually probably made um, in the the latter part of 1799 after he'd returned from the voyage. And today is kept <clears throat> the only extant copy in the kind of local history museum of the prefecture region of southern Japan, which I'll show you later, uh, which was um, Hota's kind of hometown of sorts. And here are the dimensions. At the time that it was originally created, there were two copy, well, two versions made, an original and a copy that was kept in this local um, kind of provincial castle town. There seems to be another copy made and stored in another kind of castle town samurai uh, library, though I'm still um, confirming that. <clears throat> now we all know that 1799 was a year of revolutionary energy in Europe. Napoleon I seized power in France, marking the final stage of the French Revolution. All of this continent in Europe, including Portugal, was engaged in revolutionary wars. But on the other side of the globe, a different kind of revolution was taking place in Japan. Not a political revolution, but a revolution of scientific cartography. And Japan was returning to travel and to map the open ocean beyond sight of land after a 170 year hiatus. The most recent nautical maps in Japan of the early 1600s had connected Japan to trading routes in Southeast Asia. And one can argue that this map of 1799, the sea road chart from Edo to Eastern Ezo, began Japan's exploration and mapping of the Pacific. <clears throat> so a kind of brief overview of um, the next few minutes of the talk. I'll talk about the revolutionary origins and the kind of historical context of the map. Then I'll talk a bit more about Hota himself, his personal biography, and um, the map kind of at the center of this um, discussion, and then talk about the possibility of its revolutionary consequences. So revolutionary origins. Why was this map pioneering? Well, as I mentioned, no sea charts had been made in Japan um, since the early 1600s. This was because the Tokugawa government the shogunal um, dictatorship really um, prohibited overseas travel on pain of death, largely because of concern about the infiltration of Christians and Christianity, which might prove a kind of debilitating challenge to their power. And so the short story is that they limited construction of ships to less than the kind of Japanese measurement at the time, which was um, kind of used to quantify rice yields 500 cocoa, which was roughly uh, 75 tons. And so by the end of the 1700s, I suggest that there were three motors that propelled the emergence of sea mapping. One was with offshore, offshore sailing in the Sea of Japan. So here, um, on the western side between Japan and the Asian continent, had been going on for many years to accelerate the transport of cargo 
from the port of Nagasaki, which was host to Korean, Chinese, and Dutch traders, to Eze, which was extraordinarily profitable. And the ability to do the kind of round trip transport more quickly uh, allowed merchants to increase their profits, and it was in a time of an exploding um, economy within Japan. <clears throat> a second reason that sea mapping emerged at this exact moment was because of the development of um, new categories of sailcloth, of cotton fabric, and sail plans, which I'll talk about a bit more in a minute. And finally, a growing desire for water access to the northern island of Ezo from the capital at Edo, again to transport supplies and troops to trading posts, but also um, military garrisons that were there to protect against a potential Russian invasion. So to return a moment to the Portland charts that still existed in Japan, and some of which uh, Hota is thought to have consulted that were in the Tokugawa, so the Shogun's library uh, in the Edo, the capital castle town, um, include this one. Um, from the early 1600s, when Japan still traded with Southeast Asia, in particular modern day uh, nation states such as Vietnam, Thailand, the Philippines, and Indonesia. Now this example is a Japanese nautical chart which owned by a family of sea merchants called the Kadoya um, who focused their trade with Southeast Asia. What you can see here, Japan in the upper right hand corner, Southeast Asia but you know extending to Africa across the stretch moving west. And here an insert of Japan itself with Ezo, they're written in Japanese um, which is really just a blob and also the northwest east coast of this main island of Honshu, with the capital being about here, is really kind of undifferentiated. It's a bit of, of, of guesswork and doesn't really reflect the actual uh, geography of the coastline. As a, a, a colleague, Peter Stepinski, has noted, this map presented a, quote, sea-centered view of the world and was, in fact, based on contemporary Portuguese Portland charts. And there's been lots of research we could go into why that is, but the fact is that in this map, <clears throat> the North Pacific barely appears, and the focus is regions south and west of Japan. And Holta's map would be one of the first that initiated sea mapping of the areas to the east of the Japanese archipelago. But to return to a little bit of historical background on why sea mapping emerged at this very moment, they were important kind of technological in terms of uh, weaving uh, technology, even the mechanisms used to weave that made a hardier fabric um, with a kind of, of denser woven cloth. And we see the emergence of multiple sails on ships instead of a single central rectangular sail that allowed boats to maximize wind power from multiple directions, but also gave them stability. And this is just uh, an example of some of the different uh, textures and the designs of the new weaving plans that actually went on the market just a few years in the early 1790s before Holta set sail. And we believe that um, some of this cloth was included in the sails on his ship. And to give you a sense of the boat that he made the trip in, here in the lower uh, left-hand corner, we have the Shin Sokumaru, which, as you see, um, was about 219 tons, so over twice the size of the permissible um, vessel allowed to be constructed by the central government, and in part, this was possible because this was a government-sponsored um, mission. But we see here in this very kind of crude drawing uh, multiple masts and multiple sails on the ship, which was unusual for the time, and was one of the... Um, I guess, changes to sail design and ship construction um, that was being experimented with to allow vessels to travel ever farther from land. And you can see a more close-up example. This is a reconstruction from the 1980s of one of these uh, vessels at sea with a single sail, but you see the kind of very um, thin, the kind of narrow strips, but long uh, kind of rectangular um, panels of cloth that were then stitched together to make the sail. And here, in comparison, is a Dutch vessel, an example of something that might have traded at the time in the southern port of Nagasaki. But we also see an interest in new water access 
to Ezo from the Capitol for all the reasons I've mentioned previously, but I also alluded to the fact that kind of offshore shore sailing of many days, sometimes a week without um, anchoring in port had been happening on the west side of Japan in the Sea of Japan, and it was only emerged later on the Pacific side in part because of stronger winds, uh, stronger currents, larger waves, more unpredictable uh, weather, and the kind of uh, emergence of interest in kind of conquering those challenges on the Pacific coast um, also emerged just right before Holta's trip at the end of the 18th century. <clears throat> so Holta and his map. So as you see, oh, sorry, sorry, the water hit the thing, but I think it's okay. Um, Hota was actually from a domain here in the southwest corner of Japan called Suwano Province. It's the little purple um, section right here on the coastline. And from an early age, he had had access to maritime activities, in part because his, his father, as a kind of educated, literate, and uh, trusted individual, was one of the keepers of port records in a couple of nearby um, harbors right here on the Sea of Japan coast. And Holta Niske, the mapmaker himself, um, took over those roles, as happened with a lot of hereditary positions when his father stepped down. And so he, was act he had kind of early access to this kind of maritime um, culture. And in fact, one of these ports where his uh, family served was a port from which the uh, sailmaker, the innovator, Matsu Matsuemon, who created this new kind of technology for weaving, um, either personally himself captain ships or sent ships that were kind of sponsored by his uh, family operations. And so there seems to have been kind of overlap among the two um, individuals. Um, Hota's father was also a trader in Japanese uh, made paper called washi uh, that was used for official kind of provincial documents and were later um, used for maps as well, and it's thought that that um, connection had kind of exposed him to map makers and surveying uh, early in life. It's a little bit unclear, but that some of the paper that was possibly accessed through family connections was a paper which um, the original maps from this trip were drafted on. <clears throat> and so after several years in the domain, he makes his trip to the capital of Edo, and he serves 17 years in the Astronomy Bureau. So very interesting, Sarah's um, previous presentation and discussion of uh, globes on board. It turns out that globes were not, um, I think, categorically on the voyage, uh, which I'm um, investigating, but Hota himself was a globe maker. And he was one of the kind of earlier, uh, earliest, well, not ear earliest, but one of a, a series of, in, in the genealogy of uh, globe makers, and two that are extant today include a terrestrial globe, which actually marks what Jap Japanese at the time referred to as the Near Eastern Sea, as the Pacific was referred to because it was east of Japan, and the Far Eastern Sea. And so the beginning of these voyages out into the Pacific further and further from shore were part of the process that began to collapse or consolidate a notion of a near and a far sea into a single Pacific Ocean. And so that's a separate um, discussion, but it's one of the, the many threads of um, kind of intellectual development uh, in, in parallel with this voyage. But in addition to terrestrial globes, he also created celestial globes. And he was one of the individuals, even though we'll see in just a moment, that many of the latitude measurements were off by a fair amount during his voyage that understood um, the stars and the night sky and the sun and their movement. and that was one of the reasons that he was selected for this voyage uh, to begin to take celestial measurements, which at the time were not really used uh, by Japanese sailors because they were always so close to shore, they had landmarks that they could use to kind of guide their travel. So we do know that he carried at least one other map on this voyage with him to Ezo between this port uh, Miyako, this kind of 500 kilometer voyage. And that was a coastal chart, which were then quite uh, popular and abundant in Japan because of these cargo captains. The majority of the uh, traffic in the ocean around the perimeter of the Japanese islands was um, kind of commercial traffic, either carrying rice uh, for the central government, which was a commodity and a medium of exchange, but also, uh, you know, dried fish, uh, fertilizer, cloth, 
uh, metal pots, you know, ceramics, um, that sort of thing. But as you can see here in these maps, there was a kind of very small strip of ocean generally depicted, and the idea was that, you know, captains would know where the closest port might be so they could pull in in case of a storm. <clears throat> so the map today um, displayed in this um, historical museum in Suwano, which is a prefecture in Japan known as Shimane. But you can see here, this is a replica because the original, the only one that exists, the one that was kept in the Tokugawa capital of Edo was seemingly destroyed by fire. It's a little bit unclear. There were so many across this Edo period, but also moving into the 20th century with the firebombing um, and other catastrophes um, of, of the early part of the 1900s. But we see here it's still um, kept under glass. I think that's so that visitors to the muse museum don't actually touch the replica, but this itself is what I went to see just a few weeks ago when I was in Japan, even though I have a very nice high-resolution digital copy as well. <clears throat> um, during this voyage, the kind of resulting maps were not only the one um, that I'll look at in a bit more detail now, but also a second map kept by an assistant that charted the course kind of hour by hour. And you can see the difficulty um, that they had navigating certain winds, even with multiple sails, with a kind of single large rectangular sail. These vessels sailed best by a tailwind. So when they um, encountered a headwind or just some of the um, kind of frequent changes in the Pacific coast, this is what a day or two of travel would um, look like. So textual information on the map. Um, it's not just the kind of graphic image of the coastline that's you know fairly um, accurate in these compass roses, which I'll talk about in a moment. So down here we have Edo, up here the um, departure port of Miyako, and over here Akeshi. Um, here on the kind of text in the map um, records the distances between the kind of compass rose points. So in Japanese, ri, uh, and ri, ri is a um, unit of, of distance, which is roughly four um, kilometers. It also identifies the latitude and longitude of select sites, which we'll get to in a moment. And finally, in the um, closing postscript, which also identifies the draftsman who actually kind of created the map itself, um, it gives <laughs> thanks to the gods for uh, safe passage. And this was not a kind of convention or kind of an expected acknowledgement in map making at the time, but really um, I think spoke to the relief and maybe the surprise even that this voyage had been a success and that he had, um, Hota and his crew had returned in one piece since they were such pioneers. As we see in the lower left hand corner, the actual section where the Tokugawa capital of Edo, so modern day Tokyo, uh, would have been drawn and might originally have existed has actually been removed and a variety of scholars are, are still investigating this. But whether it was um, excised to do some sort of repair work and never returned or actually cut out because of security concerns is unclear. But it seems it was likely for um, security concerns. So at the time this was a, the political capital of Japan but also a thriving commercial center. Uh, most likely over a million people living in Edo in 1799. Um, but the Tokugawa were, you could even say, paranoid about an attack about being colonized. They were aware um, from the Dutch what was going on in the rest of the world and that that attack might happen in the shores of Edo. So any map that showed evenly a, a, a remote resemblance of the shoreline and entrance to the bay in which the castle town um, was located was often removed from maps and not included in case these maps got into the wrong hands. So four central points about the map's revolutionary qualities. Um, one, it has a differential precision compared to most Western maps at the time, and that's because of the directional system that drew from kind of Chinese conventions that used a kind of zodiac system for identifying um, direction. And as you can see, most, compass, most compasses, compass roses on these maps are divided into 24 um, sectors instead of um, 32. So travel is a bit less precise. 
But I think one can make the argument that this, I, that Jota and his draftsman hope would make the map more accessible to local, local sailors who were most familiar with the Japanese system of waymaking. So it turns out in the compass rows at the very top, the Chinese characters for direction are actually blacked out. And this is a bit of an enigma. And so one kind of hypothesis is that even though we can talk about the kind of localization or the domestication of this map to make it easy for Japanese mariners to use, that potentially could have been an attempt to universalize it. Perhaps it had this kind of um, hybrid identity in a way and to more closely mimic uh, Western charts which would not have had the Chinese characters on the compass rows, even though you have all these boxes of text in the lower left-hand corner. Anyway, that's something that um, I just became aware of with a very kind of minute uh, scrutinizing of this high-resolution image. <clears throat> Another, I think, element that points to maybe it's kind of revolutionary uh, potential or identity is the, the use finally um, compass roses have been included on some Japanese maps up to this point, but it was generally decoration. It was more just a kind of aesthetic choice to give, you know, kind of color or kind of visual interest um, to an otherwise fairly kind of white and colorless field. Though the compass roses here were placed at points deliberately where captains might change course. And so we see leaving the capital of Edo, a second compass rose right at the port of Miyako where they would make the crossing. Um, a third compass rose right at the entrance to the strait that separates these main islands where captains previously who had hugged the shoreline would have made the left turn to cross to that um, port city of Hakodate. But if not, even if you had not left from Miyako to make the crossing to Akeshi, then maybe you would have gone here and then made the crossing passing by this um, peninsula. So anyway, that the compass roses, for, for the first time in many, many decades in Japanese map making, were actually inserted for use and not as decoration. Part of the text box at the beginning confirms the map maker's knowledge of planet Earth's dimensions. And this would not have been kind of common knowledge even to uh, samurai who were educated in these provincial academies for the warrior um, elite. And so we can see here how it just confirms for the reader, but I believe that it's more to kind of underscore the erudition uh, but also the maybe confidence in the map maker that he is aware of these kind of specific measurements. And finally, we have a scale on the map that's based on latitude instead of on this Japanese distance of measure it called, called Ri, or their kind of, um, kind of local um, distance unit. And this is based on latitude. So again, a kind of very hybrid, what we might say, evolving kind of transitional map that's showing the evolution from a Japanese map making tradition that is not generally, for, for domestic maps, embracing a lot of Western conventions, but is dipping a toe into including them on the chart. Some problems here, as one might expect, have kind of in inconsistent spacing across the map between um, degrees of latitude. That is not um, consistent, something that's often brought up. And another problem is inaccurate um, measurements. And here on the left, we have the measurements on this map. We have measurements almost two years later by the individual named Ino Tadataka, who's often thought of as the father of modern Japanese cartography. And one of the many reasons Hota has been eclipsed is because of his surveys from land um, and use of trigonometry, but also because they were much more accurate. And you can see the one measurement they have in common along the sea route that Enos actually equals a kind of current uh, digital measurement. So revolutionary consequences. Um, one can argue that this map and the successful journey are what of part of what uh, led, motivated the Tokugawa to finally seize direct control of this northern island, which happened soon after, which expanded their presence in the North Pacific. Uh, because it created confidence that this eastern edge of Ezo was accessible. And so the Kuril Islands, um, most of which are, um, I guess, own claim by Russia today, were just to the, to the right, east of this port of Akeshi, and the Tokugawa now felt that their mariners could reach them safely. Yet the central government wasn't ready to circulate sea charts, even as that was the original goal. And there's no evidence that this map was used on water crossings. So perhaps the Tokugawa wanted to retain that knowledge for themselves. 
It's a little bit uh, uncertain, but the circulation of CMAPs would take several decades um, to evolve. But it begins a shift to the Pacific Ocean based understanding of Japan's geography. And another element of this trip that's quite pioneering is that there were two logbooks kept on board. That was not a tradition and a, a practice in Japanese seafaring by these coastal cargo captains. And so this became a kind of um, habit, habit of mind and a, a custom for voyages uh, moving forward that became a very important source of information like rudders for um, captains on the open sea. And so I'll just finish um, by saying in the subsequent decades, there were several ocean maps made of this area between Honshu and Ezo, including a very important series of maps um, outside of Chicago in the McLean collection. As water traffic increased um, to Edo, ships needed to know about anchorages, about tide fluctuations, and underwater hazards. Uh, and this increased demand for near shore information was driven in part by the explosion in crossings from this port of Miyako. So about by the 1850s, you have maps of the ocean area in the region of Ezo like this um, that showed passages from the Kurils over to Sakhalin and everywhere in between. And if you kind of dive in to the kind of minute areas of, of the shore that show hazards and sounding depths so that vessels, depending on, they kind of use large, medium, and small size vessels would know where they could anchor safely. When Perry arrived with the US Naval Fleet in Japan in the 1850s, there was a belief that Japanese had really never used charts and that they still sailed almost exclusively next to shore. And so Holta's map and the ones that followed and the practice of transiting this passage showed that this was a bit of Western uh, kind of excep exceptionalism and uh, hubris, and that in fact the practice of blue water sailing had been going on for some time. The end. Thank you, uh, Professor Wilson. Do we have any questions or comments back in the corner? Thank you, that was fascinating. I would not say you're an interloper. I would say you're a welcome uh, change of pace and theme. So thank you for this talk. Uh, can you, I have a, this is horrible. Uh, okay, so on the, on the Compass Roses, you said that on the reproduction you were able now to discern that there was blacked out writing. Mm -hmm. Um, I, this might be anachronistic. I'm not sure of what were the manuscript practices of this period in Japan, but how can you be sure that it was blacked out as opposed to written on a silver ground that has tarnished since? You know, that is actually an excellent point. So, um, be, be careful. Yeah, this, this map is just starting to be uh, e examined by kind of professionals with all sorts of um, kind of technical uh, equipment to look in these sorts of questions. Um, that's an excellent point. Thank you. I'll ask my um, expert uh, Japanese historians about their thoughts on that. Thank you again for the talk. Thank you, it was really uh, amazing. Uh, I wanted to know, uh, you were speaking about um, uh, maps in the 17th century, well, the, the last Japanese map. Uh, I was wondering if where you are um, uh, referring to the Selden map. Um, you, you, you know the Selden map? It's, but it's the Chinese one, yes. So I was wondering if it's the same date or the same, uh, well, there's some connections with the late 17th century Japanese map and the Selden map, which is a route of Chinese merchants, something like that. 
Uh, are you? I, I don't, but maybe I should know about it. I mean, mm -hmm. I'll write that name down. I, I just look briefly at some of the other work that's been done by colleagues. Mm -hmm. Yes, on kind of but it's a Chinese. Actually, it's a uh, Selden is in English. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, yes, but uh, he, he was in possession of a, of a map of Chinese merchants, but uh, very hybrid before uh, between uh, Western and Eastern knowledge of the China Sea and. Uh, but I think I mean maybe you, Sarah, you know better than me. It's uh, the eastern part of the Chinese Sea, something like that. But I think between the China and, uh, and Japan. So I just wanted to know if there were some connections. But uh, anyway, okay. <laughs> what? Now, I'll, I'll look into it a bit. I mean, I just did a kind of brief survey of some work actually in English on Japanese portland charts um, that were created by Japanese and using Japanese scripts. I'm not familiar, but it seems a nice counterpoint. Hello, thank you for your talk. <coughs> I was just, I was also curious about the windrows and um, especially wondering if you have any comments about the particular choice of colors they have and those patterns inside the, the winds? Yeah, that's a great question. I guess my work hasn't reached um, that far yet. I mean, there's so few from this period. I mean, you can compare to the wind rows of like the port of 150 years previous because this was the first mm -hmm. of several to come over, say, the next 50 years. Um, I think the place for me to look is um, maps I haven't viewed that were in the library of the Tokugawa in Edo, um, many of which are not digitized, so I need to see them. But um, I don't know if you have suggestions. The color scheme with the red and green and black seems to draw a lot of inspiration from Western and, and European compass roses. But I don't know if anything jumps out to folks in the room. Is there anything particularly Japanese about the signs inside? Are these all forms of characters or, or just? There, there's mm -hmm. not. I mean, mm -hmm. in fact, um, I guess you're referring to these smaller yeah. emblems. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, what look almost like heart-shaped, yeah, I, I think heart. must have be copies of some sort of European map, but I haven't found the one that might have been the seed of, of inspiration. But yeah, it's a great, a great question, it's something I want to look into. Uh, congratulations, great talk. I'm going to pick on this question. And uh, uh, what kind of compasses did they use? Chinese kinds, or uh, is there any mention? Because the rose is different. I wonder what kind of model, if you know something, or it's in the text. Um, the text doesn't refer to it. In fact, the instruments that they use, they seemingly borrowed from. So many cargo captains had their own compass. But it was a Japanese um, compass which would have used um, kind of directions that looked that looked something like this. Um, the Japanese also used something called a reverse uh, compass. I don't know if those were used in, in Europe as well. But we don't know many particulars. They they mention a, a compass, but it, I mean we can draw from. Um, other examples of the period that have been preserved in other parts of Japan, but we don't know the exact compass itself that was used, if that's the question. So it's implicit, the use it's of implicit. a compass in that particular trip. They uh, mentioned that the compass was borrowed, so in a quadrant and some other surveying instruments, oh, great. Um, uh, like kind of a, a, a chain and these other calipers for the land-based surveying that they did when they actually got to the island of, um, of Ezo. Um, but we don't know about the particular objects themselves. Okay. Yeah. And uh, another doubt, maybe I was I was not paying attention. Was there a return trip? Yeah, there was a return trip, but after they survived that crossing, they made it by land. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot. Congratulations. Okay. Any more questions? I may add one uh, comment. The uh, traditional color of the lines coming out of the compass rows on European charts 
forever yeah. have been black, red, and green, yeah. alternating like that. And mm. these here is just black and red, black and red, black and red. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, interesting. Okay. Uh, if we are done with the questions, I believe the next is lunch or lunch. At, and then we return here at 1400 or 2 o'clock. Thank you all.